हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंस एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी गुवाहाटी नाउ इन टूडेज लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेंटिफ्यूज सो वेन यू गो इन टू द लैब यू आर गोइंग टू ऑब्जर्व द डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेंटिफ्यूज लाइक यू हैव द माइक्रोफ्यूज यू हैव द सेंटिफ्यूज लाइक विच इज गोइंग टू टेक अप द लार्जर वॉल्यूम्स then you have the high speed centrifuge and then this is called as the ultra centrifuge which actually can go up to the 1 lakh g uh, speed or you can have the uh, cold centrifuge or the cell culture centrifuge uh, this is the rotor what you use for the uh, in a in a typical ultra centrifuge uh, so these all these centrifuges are uh, working on a basic principle that it is uh, you are rotating the object keeping the material into a into a rotor and uh, that's how it actually separates the uh, material through the process of sedimentations so you can imagine that sedimentation is nothing but the settling of the material so if i suppose uh, take the small mud into a water and mix it and then allow it to settle down the mud will settle down and the water is going to be cleared so what this process of settling of the higher particle into the liquid is called as the sedimentation so that separation through sedimentation could be done naturally with the earth gravity so it happens because the earth gravity is uh, you know pulling all the, the all the particles at the bottom and uh, this process is going to be very slow if you allow it to be done on its own but what happen is when you doing the centrifugation you are actually making the same process much faster how you are making it much faster because as you can see that this is the actually centrifuge where you this is the axle of the centrifuge and then you are actually spinning the object so this is suppose your object and you are spinning it then what happen is the the object is going to experience two forces it is going to experience a centrifugal force which is going into the uh, outside of the uh, axis and then you can have the centripetal force which is going towards the uh, axis and if you are running it into this this particular speed of the velocity so because of the centrifugal force the object will run away from this axis and because you are keeping this object into a test you know into a tube like so you can imagine that uh, if i am keeping a material like this uh, into a object and this is connected to axis then this because of the uh, centrifugal force the object will run towards the away from the cent axis and in this process what will happen is when it runs towards away from the axis uh, it actually going to experience the centrifugal force on to this side whereas it is going to experience the frictional forces into the opposite side as well as the beyond forces beyond forces means the forces which are been dependent on to the density of this liquid in which the mat material is been suspended and where this object is going to stop this object is going to stop where these two forces are all these forces are going to be equalized which means if you will see a sedimentation of this particle if the centrifugal force is going to be bigger than the f2 plus f3 then in that case these forces are not going to stop this movement of this object and then eventually it is going to be sedimented so you can imagine that you have a tube like this so uh, ultimately it is going to reach to the bottom of the tube and it is going to be pelleted whereas in the density gradient centrifugations you since density gradient means you are actually running the material into a high density liquids so because of that the your buoyancy forces as well as the frictional forces will go up and because of that the material will not reach to the bottom of the tube instead it is actually going to be localized at a place where the f1 is going to be equalized to the f2 plus f3 so that is the place it is going to be localized which means if i am running uh, into a tube and it is actually the density gradient fluid it is actually going to stop in the some place where the buoyancy forces plus frictional forces are going to be equalized by the centrifugal forces so the rotation of a rotor about a central axis generate a centrifugal force upon the particle in the suspension and 
the density of both the sample and the solution. So, what are the forces which are going to influence the centrifugations? The first factor is the density of both the sample as well as the solutions. Then you have the temperature or the viscosity, then the distance of the particle displaced and as well as the rotation speed. At a fixed centrifugal force and the liquid viscosity, the sedimentation rate of a particle is proportional to its size, which means if you are considering the buoyance identical and then the centrifugal force is going to pellet down this particular material and the sedimentation rate is going to be proportional to the size of that particular particle and to the difference between the particle density as well as the density of the solutions. So, the sedimentation of a material is going to be dependent on to the size of the particle, the density of the particle as well as the density of that particular solutions. Uh, when you perform the centrifuge or when you do the centrifugations, you have to consider many aspects like you have to balance the samples in a practical way. You cannot balance the sample as you are uh, you know very accurately because that is very very time consuming. So, there is a set rule that if you are doing a centrifugation up to the 5000 G, you can balance simply by pouring the equal amount of the uh, uh, liquid into the other centrifuge tubes. So, uh, that is that should be good enough actually to balance the two tubes, but if you are doing the centrifugation which is beyond 12000 G you should balance the sample with a weighing balance within the range of milligrams which means if there will be a range uh, there will be a difference of 10 to 50 mg between the balance as well as the sample then it will not cause any problem to the uh, to the centrifuge but if you are doing a uh, ultra set speed or you are doing a centrifugation at a very very high speed like 35000 rpms or more than 1 lakh g then the balancing should be very very accurate which means even the 10 to 50 milligram differences is going to create trouble if you are doing the centrifugation at a very very high speed and how the balancing is important because when you do not do the balance what happen is at a central axis you have two samples one is sample the other one is your uh, balance. So, if the centrifugal force is different or if the moment of these molecule is going to be different then what will happen is that the there will be a vibration of the central axis. So, the central axis is actually going to vibrate and when it will vibrate it actually going to vibrate it will actually going to translate that vibration into the rotor as well and because of that it is actually going to create trouble into your centrifugations or it is actually going to damage your centrifuge because if this vibration will be too high it is actually going to break the central axis and that is how it is actually going to damage the centrifuge. If you use the centrifuge at very low uh, temperature like 4 degree after the centrifugation there will be a condensation of the water. So, if you are doing the centrifugation at a very low speed because your sample is uh, you know sensitive for temperature. Remember that when you do a centrifugation you actually act going to increase the temperature of that particular chamber because when you are spinning a rotor the rotor is going to spin the air around it also and because the air is going to cause the friction the friction is actually in going to increase the temperature of that particular rotor. So, that is why it is important that you run the centrifuge at a very very low temperature. So, if you run the temperature uh, centrifuge at low temperature and then you so ice will going to form inside the cup ok and then if you leave it it is actually going to cause the condensation of the water and eventually there will be a water which is going to be formed within that cup and that water is actually going to damage the sensors what is being placed just below the rotor. So, just below the rotor there are sensor in a in a sophisticated centrifuges you have the sensors which are being placed to monitor the speed of that particular uh, uh, rotors and if you uh, allow the condensation of the water or filling of the water that actually is going to corrode the sensors as well as the just below the sensor you are going to have the electronic circuits and that actually also going to be damaged. So, that is why it is recommended that you wipe the centrifuge cup with a dry cloth and you have to keep the lid open so that all the vapor should 
evaporate. As soon as you are done with the 4 degree centrifugation and there is nobody in the lab who is going to use this centrifuge, then you just open the lid, keep the centrifuge open and then you wipe the uh, uh, cup, uh, the centrifuge cup where you are actually having the rotor housed and you just leave it open so that the what all the water what is being condensed even after your piping should evaporate. Then we have the fridges and the deep fridges the, with the you know that the fridges and the deep fridges are actually being connected to the compressors and these compressors actually runs the machines so that there will be a temperature. So you can have the deep fridges like minus 20 and minus 80 or you can have the normal fridges. The fridge maintenance are going to be the remain the same as what you do in your home as well except that here the, the frequency of opening and closing of these fridges are very high compared to your home. So, and because as many times you will, are going to open the fridge, there will be going to be a condensation of the water because the fridge is cold but outside is air is hot. So, as soon as you open this hot air goes inside the air, uh, fridge and then it actually contains the moisture. So, that moisture get condensed inside the fridge and eventually what will happen it is actually start building up the ice inside and that actually is going to compromise or it is actually going to give the extra load onto the compressors and, uh, and so, so if you want to uh, keep the you know the life of your fridge for very very long time because these fridges are required to maintain your uh, to keep to store the you know perishable chemicals and all that you should clean the fridges and keep throwing the unwanted material because if you have the unwanted material in your fridge uh, the fridge is actually compressor is going to work longer because all these material has to be bring at 4 degree uh, after every opening. So, if you have unwanted material you should remove that on a periodic basis you have to clean the fridge uh, and you have to turn off the fridge and let the uh, you know fridge to get thaw because uh, whatever the ice is being built should be removed. Now, apart from that every lab normally contains the computers. So, this is a typical computer where you have this is a CPU, this is a monitor, you have the keyboard and then you have mouse here also. Uh, most of the computers are actually either it is if it is connected to the instruments or if it is being used simply for your own personal use uh, like browsing the net or uh, you know reading the research articles you have to consider or you have to very very careful about the hard disk the processors the data and the cleaners so all these uh, you know the processors or all these uh, desktops are having the fans and the fans are connected to a cabinet. So, this cabinet has to be cleaned on a periodic basis so that the fan will get the uh, clean air. Then the hard disk you have to keep taking the data backup of because uh, and you have to keep defragmenting the hard disk so that the, the hard disk will not going to be damaged. The processor also need to be you know you have to uh, work on the processor as well as the data you have to take the periodic data and then you have to do the cleaning of the uh, the, uh, com the computers what has been present in your lab and you have to uh, maintain the uh, cleanness. Uh, so, then these are the minor instruments like uh, vertex, uh, magnetic stirrers, rockers, microwaves and the heating clocks. So, these are the minor equipments which does not require much maintenance, but uh, all these are very very essentials like for example, the vertex are being used to mixing the materials, magnetic stirrers are being used to prepare the solutions, rocker is being used to rock the sample so that it actually can mix the sample like you, you have to use the rocker for performing the gel staining as well as for the western blotting. Similarly, you require the microwave in case you want to heat up the samples like if you want to prepare the agrose gels or any other kind of um, uh, you know the uh, you, you want to make the LB agars and all those kind of thing. And the heating blocks are required to prepare the SDS samples and you have to whatever the you have to heat up to 100 degree and all that. So, these are the minor equipment they do not require the special care, but you have to be little care that you have to clean them, you have to turn off if you are not in a, using them and all that.
So far what we have discussed about the common lab instruments, now we will discuss about the common lab procedures. Uh, so the what we are going to discuss are the two procedures like the cleaning the laboratory glasswares as well as the preparation of the high quality water. Why there is a need to clean the glassware? Because many of the chemicals and biochemicals we will use in the milligram or the microgram range. Uh, any contaminations could be a significant percentage of the total experimental sample. So, you know that the biochemical reactions or whatever we perform in our laboratory normally uses the chemicals in the range of milligrams or the microgram range. So, if you have a very small even a small quantity of contaminations of your previous experiment that could be a significant percentage of the existing sample. So, that could actually interfere in reactions. It could be possible that you may have some leftover chemical from your previous reaction and it could be an inhibitor of your enzyme and you are trying to perform the enzyme assays and it is not working. It is not working because you have some of the contaminants. For example, if you have just simple detergent and you are trying to perform some experiments, the detergent might be just uh, killing the cells and they are doing some other kind of artifacts. The many biochemical and biochemical processes are sensitive to one or more of the following common uh, contaminants like metal ions, detergents and the organic residues. So, the, since the biochemical reaction as well as the, uh, the life sciences like cells and all that are very sensitive even for a minor contamination of these materials, we have to be very, very careful that uh, we should be clean the glasswares very thoroughly before you use them. The cleaning of the glassware also depends on the contaminations. For example, if you have the organics as well as the metal ion as a contaminant which actually adheres to the inner wall of the glass containers, you have to wash the glasswares with the dilute detergents like 0.5 percent in water. You have then you have to follow it by the 5 to 10 times water rinsing and that actually should be good enough to remove the organics as well as the uh, metals. Uh, you remember that you have to always rinse with the distilled or the deionized water because ultimately you want to remove all the material what is been uh, so that you, you know there should be no case that you are actually remove the organic as well as the metal ions. But instead of that now the detergent is being present which you have used for cleaning. So, the cleaning is important but or the removal of the contaminant is important, but at the same time you should not have the cleaning agent to be remained there because then it becomes a contaminant again. So, you have to very thoroughly wash the glasswares with the distilled water as well as the deionized water. The metal ion contamination can be greatly reduced from glassware by rinsing with the concentrated nitric acid followed by the extensive rinsing with the purified water. Apart from that, when you have the quartz or the glass cuvettes, you can avoid cleaning the cuvette or any optically uh, polished glassware with a ethanolic KOH or other strong base as this will cause the itching or it will actually make the surfaces very rough. All cuvettes should be cleaned carefully with a 0.5 percent detergent solutions or in sonicator bath or in a cuvette washer. So, with the cuvette whether it is a quartz cuvette or the normal glass cuvettes you have to be very very careful that you cannot do you cannot use the harsh chemicals like the alcoholic KOH. You have to use the mild detergent and then you can use the sonicators or you can use the sonic bath because if you keep them in a sonic bath the all the contaminating material is going to be removed. Uh, then the cleaning of the glass pipettes. So, if you remember in the previous uh, section we have discussed about how to uh, you know use the liquid handling system. So, once those liquid handling systems are going to be dirty then you have to use them. So, the special procedures are required for cleaning the glass pipettes. You as soon as you are done with the glass pipette because glass pipettes the ends are very narrow. So, that is why immediately after use every pipette should be placed tip up in a vertical cylinder containing dilute detergent solutions. The pipette must be completely covered with the solution. So, as soon as you are done with the pipette you have to take a glass beaker or the and then you dip, dip your glass pipette keeping the tip 
tip down. Uh, after several pipettes have been accumulated the in the detergent solution, the pipette should be transferred and then you can use a pipette washer and that can be actually used to clean the pipettes. If you have a glass pipette with protein as contaminant, it can be readily reduced by rinsing with the chromic acid. So, chromic acid is a special acid what you can use to pure the glass pipette if you are using the uh, protein samples like for example, if you are using the glass pipette for cell culture purposes, then in those cases you are taking the serum and all other kind of materials. So, that actually is going to coat the inner surface of the glass pipette and that will not go simply by the detergent. So, what you have to do is you have to just first dip the glass pipette into a chromic acid solution. So, chromic acid is actually going to damage all the proteins into uh, you know it is actually going to oxidize the protein and that is how it is actually going to give you the proper cleaning. Uh, then you have to prepare the water. So, why there is a need to prepare the purified water? Because the ordinary tap water which actually comes in our home and that actually you use simply by the simple purification steps contains a number of uh, impurities like the particulate matters like sand, slit and all that. Then you it has the dissolved organics, then it has the ironic material and gases and then ultimately it also contains the microorganism. In addition to that, it also contains the pyrogens. The pyrogens are the metabolic byproducts or by uh, waste what in been produced by the bacteria or, by, or other kind of microorganisms and these pyrogens are very problematic for suppose you want to use this water for your cell culture purposes then these pyrogens are going to interfere in the cell preparation. There are many material what you can do, many ways in which you can be able to use to prepare the water for example, distillations, ion exchange, carbon absorption, reverse osmosis and membrane filtrations. Distillation we have just discussed like how to use the water distillation units. You can use the ion exchange. Uh, uh, cartridges. So, that actually is going to remove the positively as well as the negatively charged um, ions what has been present in the water and that actually is going to make the deionized water and that is going to use for most of the biochemical experiments. Then you can use the carbon adsorption. Carbon adsorption is also going to do the same as the ion exchange materials. Uh, then you can do the reverse osmosis as well as the membrane filtrations. The water purified by the deionization, reverse osmosis or distillation is very much acceptable because it gives you the pure form of water. There is a problem if you are preparing the water by ion exchange method. As I said, you know, if you are making a deionized water, that actually is going to because when you are making uh, passing the water through a uh, ion exchange matrix, you are act, the, the, some of the chemicals are being leached from the ion exchange matrix and that actually contains. So, it makes the water deionized, de but at the same time the, the chemical what is being leached from the ion exchange column actually in contaminates the water with this organic substance and this organic substance are actually increases the ultraviolet absorption of that particular water. So, that is why if you are doing any experiment where you are actually doing the, uh, the, uh, the absorption experiments like if you are measuring the absorption of that particular solutions prepared in the water, then you should not use the deionized water. Instead, you can use the water which is being prepared by the distillations because that actually is not going to add these organic substances and that actually is not going to increase the absorbance of the water into the UV range. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.